I'm Joel Martin, Cloud and Applications Modernization Research Lead here at HFS. ERP modernization is an ongoing challenge for many organizations. But over the next 30 minutes, I'm going to be joined by Dmitry Karkovsky, Chief Product Officer at Unit 4. And we're going to talk about how it can mean opportunity as well. Today, we're going to talk about the evolution of your business platforms into cloud native models, really get into how delivering value is, is a true opportunity now with, with the cloud and with opportunities that we have, rethinking how applications are built and then consumed by users. We're gonna go into the differences between designing solutions uh, for product-centric organizations versus people-centric, which is really what all organizations are becoming now as, as we deal with experiences both inside and outside the organization. And then we're gonna banter around low-code, automation, and how solutions are being built from microservices, really be becoming cloud native in their DNA that allow organizations to adjust, adapt, and act really quickly to bring value in real time to their customers, to their employees, and of their business leaders. So with that, over to you, Dimitri, maybe a little introduction about yourself, your role at Unit 4, and, and, and what drives you and the company to, to really bring thought leadership to the market. Well, great to see you, Joe, again, uh, and uh, very excited uh, to be a part of this, uh, this podcast. So uh, a little bit about me. I am a Chief Product Officer at Unit 4. This basically entails thinking about the future of our products, you know, figuring out the product strategy, spending quite a bit of time with customers and understanding their needs, their aspirations, how they run their businesses, how they think about improving you know, the processes, and then sort of translating this into the new products that we build, imagining different solutions, imagining different experiences, you know, thinking how we can help our customers, how we can automate the work they do, how you know, ultimately we can help them achieve uh, better results. Um, I've been at Unit 4 uh, for a few months now and very excited to be here. My background before, I spent uh, four years at Google prior to this, uh, working in Google Cloud Platform, primarily in machine learning um, oriented data services and applications. And uh, for about seven years before that, I was a chief product officer at uh, SuccessFactors. Great. Uh, SAP SuccessFactors now. <laughs> that's great. That's, that's it's really exciting. I'm sure you're going to bring a lot of domain uh, experience to this to really talk about, you know, your role in industry, your experiences with customers all over the place. And, and that really brings me to some data points that kind of set up this conversation. Um, back in the first half of this year, we did a large survey of global 2000 companies. 65% of them told us they saw the cloud as a cultural change agent for their business, bringing services closer to their users and to their customers. Interestingly, though, 43% are really are, are moving those business processes to the cloud. So there's, there's an adoption of cloud, but it's not as rampant as you would believe by reading the media. But more worrisome was one in four of the folks then saw cloud as a cost play. So they talk a lot about it being a change agent and moving business processes into the cloud to be closer and more functional. But then they immediately start switching from a value play and how this is going to create business value and outcomes to you know, a good chunk of them seeing it still as a cost play. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. I think as the companies evolve, they look, uh, you know, to both deliver better business results, but also improve the cost structure, you know, and obviously cost structure is a part of their business results. You know, it's the opportunity for them, for customers to sort of reimagine how they run the business, to reexamine the processes and, and see whether the software of the future needs to, to implement different kinds of processes. Again, software is the mirror into how the company is run. It's just a tool that enables companies to, you know, to run better. So, so I think it's a it's it's just an opportunity. You know, the, the the customers I talk to, they think of this as an opportunity, opportunity to rethink the processes, opportunity to rethink the way they work, and then and then in, express it all in this different kinds of software that allows them to do those kinds of things. And, you know, we talk, you know, Joe, we, we, you and I talked a little bit about sort of the difference between the, you know, product-based businesses and, 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 and people-centric businesses and how they operate. And, you know, what I see quite a bit, particularly in the people-centric business, which is where the types of businesses Unit 4 serves primarily and focuses on is, you know, one of the very, very important characteristics this companies look for is flexibility. 
you know, particularly in this day and age, right? With, you know, with COVID, with changing patterns of sort of remote or in the office, with how teams gather and, and operate with each other, you know, ability to have this way to, to, to float and change and to be fluid and flexible and readjust based on, you know, the, the mm-hmm. sort of landscapes that, that a lot evolve around them and the business conditions on, you know, on the competitive conditions or on, on changes in business models, the, the, the need to be fast and adjust fast and be flexible is really, really fundamental to, to how companies work, particularly people-centric companies. Um, you know, as opposed to often in the world of more product-centric companies, they value stability, right? They, you want to build the process and then you want to keep it stable and repeatable everywhere, every time, kind of go the same way. You know, that's, you know, in manufacturing and distribution and sort of supply chain, those kinds of, those kinds of areas, the stability is a very, very important characteristic versus in people-centric businesses, you know, flexibility is, 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 is valid quite a bit, particularly, you know, in, in the environment we've been living in in the last couple of years. Yeah, and I, I, I think you're spot on there. And I think flexibility is probably one of the more operative terms these days. And that's why people are driving to the cloud is, is to bring services in there, to bring workloads, to bring engagement closer to those that need it. Um, uh, and a lot of that, again, reverts back to the data strategy as well. And one of the things that, you know, when we were talking through your vision for where, you know, your, your core systems of records your ERP solutions, your financial solutions need to evolve. It, it's, it's really adapting to something that, that those systems tip, were never really considered, which is the word flexible. Um, so, so maybe you can tell a little bit more about, you know, what is flexibility? You know, what, what have you done to address that flexibility and make, your, make solutions more flexible and make the ERPX solution more flexible? Yeah, it's, you know, a lot of that has to do with the ability, A, to have, different processes for different work groups, different, different teams, you know, and, and be able to change those things very quickly, right? You know, it's the, one of the big advantages of, of, of cloud software, software as a service is that, you know, it's a lot easier to, 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 to change it, to evolve it, you know, and to rewire it in different ways, both from the vendor side, the, the sort of the vendor delivery cycle is a lot faster, you know, and from the customer side where they could, you know, take this the core solution and configure it in different ways, you know, for different work groups and do it sort of continuously. Whereas in the past, there was sort of a cycle of, you know, you buy, you go through a long implementation cycle, and then you kind of like locked and loaded and done and don't ever touch it or change it again because, you know, it's expensive, it's hard, and it requires sort of a lot of rethinking, a lot of investment. Now, what we see a lot is, you know, continuous changes that, that, that customers, you know, want to have in their software. And they want the software that enables these changes. It enables changes without, you know, with, without, you know, high cost component or long periods of time to, to be able to achieve that. So, so that's, 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 that's very important. Um, it's also a lot of this has to do with connecting, you know, different parts of the flows, different parts of the system together in a holistic, you know, in a holistic sort of a business management system. Whereas in the past, you know, you had your financials, you had your projects, you had your procurement, you had your char, they all kind of operated in their own little silos, right? And then you had to, you know, build sort of middleware technology to connect it in some, some, some interesting ways. And it was always hard, you know, having it all as a part of sort of an end-to-end holistic process where, you know, the data flows freely from one place to another. You know, as you think about staffing a project, you need to understand, you know, who are the people who are available? You know, what skills do they have? You know, where are they located? You know, and if you just examine these two or three questions, you know, uh, the, the location may be as a part of the core HR system, you know, skills may be a part of a town management or project management system, um, you know, proficiencies or project, you know, p- participation might be a part of sort of the project management system. And all of these needs to come together into, into the staffing decision, right? So you need to have the, the, all these systems sort of connect and snap and drive each other and reinforce each other and have, so, you know, some connection points between them. And, and then I think another thing that's very important is, 
is just the experiential side of it. Again, you know, we've, in the enterprise software, we've been talking about this for, for a while now, but, you know, as consumers, we're used to very specific experiences. Phone becomes, you know, the working tool, you know, for many of us where we spend hours and hours, you know, on the phone using it as sort of the main tool through which we deliver, you know, sort of work, some of the work components, work deliverables, right? And, you know, having, you know, both, you know, mobile functionality, the, you know, ability to plug into um, messaging platforms like Slack or Teams or others and interact with various systems and, 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 and others in the organization through these without having to go into this sort of a big monolithic, you know, ERP, quote unquote, becomes very important experientially, right? That, you know, quick, lightweight, 10 second interactions where, you know, when something gets stuck, you can get stuck. When you need information, you can get this information. When you need help, you can get this help, you know, and, you know, having, you know, ability to do all this work on the edges, but still system or record being able to capture all this, you know, information and reflect sort of the current state of the projects, financials and so on. Yeah. And, and again, I would, mobile is a great example of, of how people want to consume information. And then you gave this great example about how the different silos within a, a business software solution have to be delivering HR, customer, financial information. Previously, and, and I've been in this industry, all these things were hard coded. They were built on personas, but they were very rigid, which made both upgrading the solutions difficult but also really honestly licensing and getting the information out there because it was so rigid. But I think you've come up with some different ideas on, as you started to talk about, you know, well, Unit 4 took a big step in kind of tossing that out and saying there's a better way to think about how we build an application that can recognize the needs of, A, the benefits of moving to the cloud, B, people are consuming not on large large desktops anymore, but they're consuming on their, their mobile devices when they're in the job at the customer's site and they need records that help them deliver value. Uh, and then third, you know, also creating an environment that can be adapted as needs change, as the culture of the company changes, mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't interfere with the core system. So maybe you could talk a little bit about you know, what drove that? Because that really fits into what we at HFS call the one office mindset, which is a digital delivery of solution that incorporates native automation, people and process change, and getting access to the decisions and data without redesigning your technology stack each and every time. So maybe that's yeah. an area we can kind of kick around some more. Yeah, I think one, you know, let me offer kind of one observation on this. Why is it that consumer applications are so easy to use, or many, you know, as a, a, generally speaking, right? The, the consumer applications are so much easier to use and, you know, loved and adopted and enterprise applications traditionally have been sort of harder to use. I think one of the reasons for this is that consumer applications are designed for a specific purpose, right? There isn't this endless configuration, customization, that sort of takes this toolbox and mangles into something that's sort of kind of like a fit, but not really. You know, consumer applications are often developed with a very single purpose in mind for a specific user, for a specific task. You know, whereas enterprise applications, as I said in the past, the, the typical pat pattern is you develop sort of a tool set and then consultants come in and they use these elements of the toolbox and kind of make it sort of right for you, but it's it's difficult. And so that was kind of one of the big observations with which we started the redesign of our ERPX product, the product we discussed in the past, right? And the goal in mind for us was, is there a way to deliver a software for a particular industries and country? You know, it's usually it's industry country permutation, that, right? That to them would look like it was designed specifically for that. But to us, we could do it at scale. You know, we could create multiple versions of the software, you know, essentially using the same technology, but, but essentially, but creating these versions, if you will, or, 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 or configurations of the solution we call them industry models, you know, that, that feel to these industries like they're built specifically for that. That was kind of the, the goal, right? And with this, we started this redesign. And, you know, how do you get there? 
Well, first you need to sort of, you know, decompose. We had to decompose what we had into, you know, microservices, individual components that could be combined in sort of different ways. We also needed to really think through, you know, what constitutes sort of industry specific stuff? How do you, what constitutes country specific stuff? What are the different kinds of users? And can you express these specificity through you know, outside of code without having to write the code. So we could have a people who are specialists in these domains and these industries who could quickly put together, you know, this very, very specific solutions, you know, to this, for, you know, for these customers without having to go through the expense of writing the code, testing the code, you know, deploying the code and, we, and which slows you, those slows you down. And if you think about sort of a broader enterprise, a broader consumer space, you know, there's been, huge also evolution towards this mass customization, you know, sort of custom solutions delivered the scale. You know, many examples of this, just, I was just looking, just generally doing a quick survey, you know, from Invisalign, my kids use these braces, right? The, you know, how, you know, how, how do they, how do those work? Well, they're not sort of generic things. They fit your mouth specifically, right? You know, the, the dentist takes, takes a, essentially a snapshot, and then they're 3D printed, you know, for you. If you look at ski boots, if you look at golf clubs, if you look at suits, shirts, you know, a lot of these, you know, spaces now, you know, the fastest growing subsegments with the spaces is, is custom at scale, you know, and most of these custom at scale kind of ideas were enabled by specific breakthroughs in, in technologies like 3D printing enabled, you know, a whole bunch of these things. Or, you know, for clothing, you know, fast laser cutting, you know, and precise laser cutting, you know, enable ability to, you know, I send you my dimensions and, and as a vendor, you could create a suit or a shirt or whatever the case might be, you know, that's, that's custom for me. Similarly for us, I think the, the technologies that evolved over the last three, four or five years, you know, cloud microservices, machine learning, you know, different approaches to, you know, to, to integration enables us, enabled us to, you know, take all these like specific custom elements out and, 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 and be able to express them again outside the code and deliver, you know, localizations and, and industry specific stuff very, very fast with very, very different economics, which allows us to cover many more different segments and some se sub segments within, within that. I think that's kind of the breakthrough that, that happened. It's not like in the past, people wanted to build generic software. It's just that the economics of building software did not allow to make it specific for the industries. And now, now we actually can. Yeah, I think you're spot on there. One thing that excites me about this conversation is we're looking at, at flexibility. We're looking at speed to delivery, which everybody desires, because when they have a problem, you know, the old models were send in the requirements, the dev team will work on it. Six months later, well after Christmas, when you wanted that tool to be ready, it's ready for you. And hopefully it's still relevant for the next holiday season. But in instead, you know, with this bold re-architecture, you get flexibility and speed, but you just touched on something I think that we could explore a little bit more, which was the customization at scale that's demanded. Because customization was always considered a bane, whether you were designing software or you're on the consumer side wanting something else. Because the, when we look at profitability, we look at costs, customization always costs more, which impacts the total availability of your marketplace. But customizing at scale and letting your customers customize at scale without impacting the core data set, without in, impacting yeah. the core solution, that's where it gets exciting to me. And that's where I thought, you know, when we first had the conversation, we really needed to have this conversation because that got exciting because you bring in new thinking around how are people going to customize and they're not going to customize yeah. with a lot of hard code. They're looking at low code. How are they going to customize? How do they automate data and workflows to get to the information that's relevant without becoming, you know, without, a, without well, while co-innovating or co-creating with others in their team on the technical and business side. And then, Really, again, that people-centric aspect of knowing your customer and being able to not only react but anticipate their needs requires a certain level of the right information and the ability to manipulate that to customize that service. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, that's spot on, I think. And, you know, when, again, what, what, what are typical customizations, right? They have to do, you know, you have your, your AR, you have your AP, you have your general ledger. I mean, so, so the, the key data structures are not that different, you know, across different customers. But the way they're used, the way the workflows are configured, the way the reports that the, you need, you know, you look at the business in different ways. So you need different analysis, different reporting. You know, you could have different regulatory regimes in different countries, you know, different metrics matter, you know, and, and you need to connect to different outside systems. Again, that's a part of sort of customization, you know, whether you're in different industry or different country or both you know, integration with those outside, a different outside system is important. So all of this sort of constitutes this sort of customization. And you touched upon something very, very, you know, important to us, which is how do you do it at scale? And this sort of low code, no code tooling is the answer to that, right? It's, it's actually one of the answers to that. The other answer is the general architecture system that, that exposes the APIs, that exposes what's happening within individual modules. So it posts, you could post a message or event, you know, to others who could listen, do something about this. And then creating this sort of a low code, no code layer on top of this, where we can package different solutions or, or, or our partners or customers. And you could sort of become finer and finer grain. It kind of like fract, fractal out from, you know, into deeper and deeper in the verticals and sub verticals and countries. And again, the tool works very, very simply. It's sort of essentially the local no code tool we have, an orchestration layer that could say, I hear something's happening in this module, in this area in procurement. Let me ask more about this. Let me get this result. You know, okay, then it seems like I need a user input. You know, I could create a simple one form, one, one field dialogue with the user and maybe push it into the Slack channel where they are and ask them a question. You know, when user responds, I take the response and put it over here in this area. And so now you could create these kinds of experiences without writing a, a single line of code, you know, just expressing, you know, just through the tool, you know, pulling modules, getting the, get in the, getting their outputs, getting the inputs, creating user interactions, collecting data from the users and re reflecting it all in the core system. So you could start creating this, this very rich, very specific, you know, targeting industries or countries or, or particular companies, even layers, you know, around this. And that is what makes it right for them. That is what makes it feel like it was developed just for their companies, even though it's done at scale through this, through this, through this tooling. And that's sort of the power, that's, that's our 3D printing or laser cutting, you know, the, the breakthrough technology that enables this, you know, at scale, you know, customization. Maybe you can tell me some, you, you touched on some of the, the customer value that you're starting to see. Maybe you have some examples of some of your customers and how they're actually doing this that you can share that, that will give some real world sort of concrete examples of, of how. Yeah, yeah, I mean, a lot of this is the littlest things, you know, that, you know, we, we see customers now do, for instance, you know, every customer has kind of the same set of issues. Like when they acquire, you know, when they acquire a new customer, they want to do a credit check. You know, if somebody's not paying, they want to do collections. If, you know, when they generally get a new customer, they want to make sure that they have all the right data, you know, for them. So they need to acquire this data, the location, the phone number, for the, the address, whatnot, right? So, you know, usually... You know, in every country, there's a set of specific services that provide this information, right? So a customer comes in and you need to, you know, look up their data from the, you know, Chamber of Commerce or whatever the case might be, you know, and then you want to do a credit check. And, you know, you're a company that is based in the UK or in the US, but you have an affiliate or a customer that comes from Norway. How do you do that? Well, in the past, you do that manually you know, most of the time, you know, somebody, you know, a person sits down and, you know, on Friday afternoons, they go through the list of those kinds of things and they log in into some government site or the credit check site for that country. And they kind of log, look it up and then they copy paste this information from here over there. And, you know, it takes 30 minutes or 45 minutes, but, you know, 
they do it over and over and over and over again across different countries, right? And in some main countries, if you're a US country, UK country, you may, you may integrate with like DNB or something like that. But in your smaller countries, you probably do it manually. You know, with us now, what we see over and over again, we package this up, but customers do this using the no code tooling. They say, when there is an event that there's a new customer, you know, take their information about them and ping this database through this API endpoint, you know, and get the result that says, you know, here's the com- you know, information or do a credit check and says, the, and get the information back that says, you know, the good state or bad state. And based on that, decide what you want to do, you know, let the transaction go through or have a manual review. Very common. We've had a whole bunch of customers do something like that. Yeah, I, I like that uh, you're bringing low code and automation two fundamental tools of being successful business yeah. going forward, you've brought them together, but you haven't hidden them behind the proverbial firewall of the DevOps team. You're exposing not only yeah. the, the them to be able to work with APIs, but more importantly, exposing them to the actual people in the field to say, this is what I need. I can conceptualize it and I can start doing it. Uh, these are all really bold steps. I mean, why, why are you guys sort of a breakaway kind of thought leader on this what what's what's happening that where's the magic happening that's driving this because i haven't seen this kind of leadership from some of the traditional players in your space well look i you know i'm obviously i don't want to talk about anybody else because you know they should talk about themselves i get we really focused on we could do for for our customers but you know some of this has to do with timing you know because software generally goes through sort of re-architecture cycles, you know, every so often, right? And it just so happened that we were ready to jump into this three, four years ago. And a lot of these technologies really have evolved, you know, right around this time. So in some ways, sort of a combination of being right place at the right time. And, you know, and this predates me, but, you know, I have to compliment the team, having the courage to jump in and say, we will change what we have. And we like, you know, take it apart and reassemble it in a different way to take advantage of this new technologies, you know, and I, and I think that's, that's really paying off for us that now that we're sort of through this re-architecture cycle and we are doing this this way, the way I describe and, you know, frankly, a lot of the software we're building now, the new functionality, we build in this low code, no code way. It's not, it's not just a tool for customers. It's not just a tool for partners or professional services. A lot of what we will be building or are building is built not in the core of ERP, but outside of those microservices or built in this low code, no code, no code way, you know, in a descriptive kind of way. Um, and so, again, by having said that, Joe, you know, we are definitely in the first inning of this. You know, the, the degree of connectivity, the degree of specificity that we could provide to these customers to really achieve that vision of it's software that's right for their business, not a business, but for their business. You know, we're still, you know, there's a long road ahead. You know, we, I feel like we have a lot of tools, you know, to do that, but again, there's still so much we could do. And I'm, that's what makes me excited. And that's why I wanted you know, to be a part of this story with this company. Oh, for sure. One thing I also like is you know, building on that is, is something you mentioned earlier, which was the industry specific configuration model. So again, thinking about those customers and bringing that together. You know, you talked about having that industry specific mesh view that is the config models and bringing all this together. So how does that play into it? Well, so that's, that's a part of it, you know, so I talked quite a bit about, you know, making sure that the software we build Transform it, transforms itself, morphs itself to be right for the businesses. But, you know, various, and the examples I use, very specific common problem that we see, you know, in every customer conversation, they say, okay, well, that's great that your staff works this way, but, you know, I have, you know, 200 other vendors in my IT landscape, you know, there's a CRM system and a CPQ system and a specialized project system or a grant management system, you know, for nonprofits or, or for, you know, student information system for higher ed or, and then, you know, for, as, as I said, for every country, I have, you know, you know, the bank connections I have to make and, 
you know, I, I do collections and I do credit checking and I do treasury and I do, you know, all this other stuff, right? Basically for every country, right? And so we, the, as, as we talk to these customers, they say, okay, your thing works great, but your thing needs to connect to everything else. And that's often, a, you know, expensive, long, you know, integration, you know, process, right? And that's where we sort of, we thought, heck, we could use exact same tools to connect us to third parties or actually connects third parties to each other, not even with us, you know, using the same low code, low code, no code tooling, you know, so that, that we could create this meshes for these different industries. And, and that's what, that's what, yeah, that's what we're working on now, where, you know, a lot of that is providing the connectivity for a typical set of vendors that exist for each one of those industries you know, in delivering this connectivity or, or con connection and integration as a product that we maintain, we support, that we evolve, we, we follow the changes in the APIs, we understand the data, you know, formats and, and, and we connect data together, you know, kind of for different industries. That's, that's the idea of those industry specific meshes, which is, you know, connectivity between, you know, integration between third party vendors and us, and in some instances between the third party vendors, the typical customers in this industry's use. So that, yep, sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's that that was that was kind of it. I was gonna say the, the one thing advantage I see out of that is by architecting your solution in this form and being so open to working with others, it, it builds a certain level of trust within the organization that they have a dynamic, flexible relationship with, with core tools now. And they can start really focusing on not just buying all these additional add-ons. But what can they build themselves and what is really important to the experiences yeah. of employees and their users? Again, going back to that one office framework of instead of just keeping having to buy a smorgasbord of solutions because they don't have that flexibility, because it's not delivering the value, because they need to add this accent or, or extra functionality. It, it sounds like you've kind of rethought it from a standpoint of we know what we do well. We can organize the data but we're really going to prioritize and exposing and making that data, you know, again, customizable at scale so that it can really achieve a lot more, which fundamentally to me fuels what a lot of companies are going through right now, especially coming out of the pandemic, which is finding themselves really in a, a cultural transformation or an evolution of yeah. how their people want to work, how their customers want to engage, which again, yeah. with rigid, you know, fixed systems, is leaving a lot of customer, a lot of companies really struggling with where do I start on my cloud journey? Yeah, yeah. It's also I think you said something that triggers some, another another thought. I I, I want to make sure that's important to us. In the past, there's been a little bit of a tension between sort of the best of breeds and suites, right? You know, you could get like this specialized service that does something really well, but it doesn't fit into your suite, or you get a suite that has a lot of the different components but the individual components are not so awesome, right? You know, because they just, suites often could not invest as much time or they didn't understand this specific subdomains sub well enough, as well as the, as the specialist in these, right? Now, if you go back now, three, four, five years ago, one of the big sort of evolutions in the, in the enterprise space been, has been sort of the proliferation of sort of specialized services, the API services. Right, for you know, any you know, from Stripe, you know, to 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 SendGrid, to to messaging, to whatever, many many very very specialized services delivered as APIs, right? And and I think that's 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 kind of another element that we want to make sure that we we were able to capture that you know, as a customer, that you could sort of compose what you want, you know, and consume some stuff from us, consume some of best of breeds. But for all of this to be able to plug in, you know, into each other very, very easily, right? And then in the future, if another service appears and you want to replace something that you have, you can unplug it and replug the next one, and the thing just goes on and, and it works and it works just fine, without having to like rip out the whole system, which was often the case. You know, you want to replace a small component, you have to like level the whole house down and rebuild it again from scratch. You know that, and you know, whereas now when things are Build as microservices, they're all individual. There's sort of, sort of agreement in, in how they talk to each other and, you know, sort of orchestration system that we deliver about connecting them. It becomes a lot easier to 
unplug, replug, use the best of breed, to different ones, different ones in different countries. Um, and that again goes back to that flexibility that we started with. That you know you don't want to get stuck as a business. You want to evolve, 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 and you want the system that not just functionally right for you, but it allows you to evolve and change. That's like almost the 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 more important characteristic I think these days. No, I completely agree because you know again having gone through ERP implementations, having gone through. Uh, revisiting and upgrading. That's a very painful part of a customer's journey. Having a solution that's modular and thinking about how it's going to flex and change around your business versus you around it, I think is a very compelling story there. And, and one, yeah. especially for people-centric organizations, is very important because they are growing quickly through acquisition, through their own partnerships, through changing customer demands. And, and that flexibility is really a key differentiation between the people-centric world uh, of solution delivery versus the products, which you're going to be stamping out the same widgets at a certain cadence and driving certain efficiencies. It, it, there's fundamental differences in customer needs there. And again, I think that's the, going back to the industry centric discussion we have, going to that, that at scale discussions we've had and the flexibility really kind of brings home to me a, a differentiation there. But I would also argue when we think about that customization at scale, that's as applicable to a product-centric organization as a people-centric organization. And, and, yeah, yeah, that, that's probably true. That's probably true. So, um, well, this has been great, Dimitri. I've really appreciated the conversation. Any parting thoughts? Any, any, any words of wisdom for people out there considering, you know, what they need to do to continue on this cloud journey, to be flexible, to, to still stay true and really get hold of their data that, that, that you would share from your experiences or, or where you see your, you know, your vision and where you're taking your current teams? Yeah, I think it's, it's just never, it never stops. I think that's sort of my, my conclusion from all of this is, is, you know, and building this notion of change and having change be sort of important characteristic you know, of the system and ability to sustain the change and ability to sort of continuously re-examine, you know, your existing processes is super, super important. You know, technologies in enable these now. And again, we're at the first inning, as I said, of, of something like this. But, you know, if you look, if you look at sort of a broad technological la landscape, you know, the, you know, natural language understanding, the, the vision, you know, all this sort of machine learning enabled technologies around sort of underst data understanding and, you know, dealing with unstructured data and structured data in combination together. And how much of the work, I think, is still automatable. You know, we look at, you know, just the other day we did a product, product review around, you know, one of the areas in timesheets, for instance, you know, it was just, just an example. But, and, you know, you can ask yourself a question for so many of those things, anytime a user needs to provide some input and input some data, you know, almost always you could say, you can ask the question, can we just get this data automatically somehow from, from just observing the state of the world, the state of the system, you know, observing the calendars, you know, ability to sort of interact sort of through natural language and through what people say, you know, so, so I think there's so much that, time that we could save to customers and users, you know, by just applying machine learning, for instance, and, and different sub, sub sort of subdomains within machine learning, you know, to, to these problems. So, so I, I think that the, going back to sort of my original point is, you know, anytime you feel like, oh, well, we got to this great point and it's probably good now, you know, there's another, another layer and another layer, another layer, another layer. And so, you know, picking the vendors, building a system that can sustain the change, I think is probably the biggest lesson because we don't, you know, th th things just evolve very, very fast these days. And what you cannot get caught in is it works for me now, but I'm stuck. That's, that's like a cardinal sin, I think. I completely agree with you. And I hear so often people talking about horizon strategies. And too often, poor planning requires you to really revamp your whole technology stack each time you hit 
one of these horizons that people talk about. And, and to your point, it's an ongoing journey. There is no finish line for yeah. companies, for yeah. customers, for people. And, yeah. and, you know, baking in automation and AI into the DNA of your products is going to be what plays dividends, but also the ability for customers to take the most advantage of that. And, I, and we're seeing that across the industry. We're validating it constantly that this is a, a market demand that is being met, but still hasn't really crystallized. And I think you're, you're rethinking about how to approach it from an industry, from an architectural, and from a uh, just a, a customer engagement model is pretty forward thinking and pretty attractive for, for customers to kind of really delve in to say, that can get me across multiple horizons, not get me somewhere quicker, but be survivable and sustainable for the long term. So yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. So. Hey, with that, uh, I want to thank you for your time. This has been a great conversation. A lot to think about, a lot to unpack, but but really exciting. And I, and I, I don't use that often when I'm thinking about business applications, that they can be exciting again. But, you know, it's exciting because it's contextualized in the way people want to work and in the environments they want to work, both cloud and mobile, and then their ability to basically develop and do things without having to go through a massive amount of retraining and, and, and cultural change. And, and all those things come together. And that, that's, that's what, those are really competitive advantages for a company to adopt when they can do that. So with that, any parting thoughts? No, this is it. Thank you. It was, it was, it was awesome to, to, to talk and it stimulated a lot of, a lot more thoughts on my side. So, so thank you for this and, uh, and uh, excited to continue, you know, doing things together. Great. Thank you, Dimitri. 